Yeah, so um, so this week, um, Bob is going to take us through um, Glorut and, 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 and Munin. We're going to see um, how, what we can get out of uh, the two monitoring tools. And um, yeah, it's going to be uh, quite interesting. Uh, I'm particularly interested in uh, Glory. So this is the third, the third uh, time we're having um, server admin meetings uh, this year. And uh, yeah, so Bob. Thanks, Tito. Good morning, everybody. Um, let me see if I can share my screen. Uh, oh, hang on. This one. Okay, yeah, good morning. Everybody see the screen all right? You should be seeing a browser window with glowroot.org. Yes, we can. Yeah, yeah, you can see it. Yeah, okay. So I thought, no, today um, I'll spend a little bit of time just going through um, this useful little tool that we found um, has solved, solved many problems over the last few years. Um, I discovered it about four years ago, four or five years ago, we used it to diagnose some issues that they were having with a measles immunization campaign in Bangladesh. Um, anyway, um, as most of you on this call know, managing DHIS2 can be, can be a tricky business. It's a big and complicated piece of software. Everybody has different kinds of user loads, different kinds of sizes of databases, different types of programs that they're running. And so sometimes it can be hard to know what's going on when things are slow or when things are crashing. Um, and so it's really important to have some, some good monitoring and diagnostic tools on. And certainly one of the most useful ones I found is this glow route. Um, Glowroot is particularly, it's a, it's a, um, it's a JVM um, agent, really. It's essentially looking at what's going on inside your Java virtual machine. And it's got some useful built-in graphs and, and metrics um, that give you some good eyes on what's happening. But it's only one part of the picture, of course. I mean, as you know, the, the DHIS2, in order to make it run, there are other pieces involved as well. Very importantly, the database and also the, um, the web proxy and also the, the operating system that it runs upon. If you have been using the DHIS tools, and I know some of you have for some years, but even if not, some people have set them up independently, you'll know that it's also important to monitor other aspects of the system other than the JVM. And by default, we install this thing called Moonin. Um, I've got it running here. And thanks to Kwame and Oswald, we're actually looking at the, at the um, live system in Ghana. Just because looking at these monitoring tools on test databases, they don't really tell you much. But, um, um, when you have some live data, it's important to look at. The thing about Moonin is that by default, you have hundreds and hundreds of graphs, um, probably too many. And it's a big problem with a lot of monitoring tools. When you, have, you have lots and lots of, of information, but it's important to know which ones are useful. Um, when I am looking at Moonin, normally the kind of things typically I would look at, I put this overview, I go to the host machine, I look at the system. This is one of the most important starting points, and you have a look at what your CPU usage is like. Um, if you've got a lot of excess CPU usage, then um, um, you know you've got some kind of problem to investigate. There's a little bit of a problem here, all right, that um, I hadn't really figured out before. This is usually, usually, 
you see on the CPU, this is kind of normal use down the bottom. There's this purple stuff up above. The purple stuff is, is IO weight. Now, I've not had the opportunity to investigate this, but Oswald and Kwame, this is something to make a note of. The CPU is spending a lot of time in IO weight. Um, I don't know if anybody can give me a suggestion why they think that is. Why would a CPU be spending so much time in IO weight? What does that indicate? So, so uh, I think I had that issue before uh, from Cellion. Uh, when it's uh, it's because um, the 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 RAM um, is is old. If you have a very old RAM, some of these uh, hosting provider, what they do is that they give you a, a, a specification, and then they don't tell you the type of RAM. And if the RAM is very very old, it spends a lot of time on I/O weights, and then you have these spikes, and then you don't know why it occurs. But then when, when we requested to them, based on the, spe the specification of the RAM, we sent the request to them that we want them to change the RAM. When they change the RAM, that was fixed. I, I, I think we had a couple of, prob of prob that problem for a couple of times. I think we contacted you and you yourself was not surprised at it. But, but that's the main reason. Really, you know, I think what I mean, but, but, um, you mean the disk or? Uh, yeah, because no, I, I think, think, I think um, with IO, you're typically talking about the disk. What I think means the is technology. A... I think it's the, the, the technology. We are, it's better to use the uh, SSD disk rather than that disk. I think it can improve yeah. the thing. Yeah, IO weights generally, what it means is that the CPU is waiting for a, a an IO operation to complete. And that's usually okay. a disk operation. So okay. I mean, this, I, this server generally has been, and I know, Gerald, you had that problem with DediServe that they give you very bad disks. <laughs> um, this server generally has been performing reasonably well. Uh, I'm not sure why you have this here, but it's something that, that we probably should investigate. But anyway, this is one of the first things I look at, right? Look at the CPU usage. We're not, we're not here to solve problems today. We're just looking at the diagnostic tools. Um, mm -hmm. So... Yeah, this is something to look at. And Oswald Kwame, I think we should make a note. Let's see what's going on with that disk. We don't expect to see that. This is running on Linode. Linode disks are usually very good. So um, there might be something happening. Other thing that I tend to look at, ah, yeah, the memory usage. Memory usage here, um, what we can see is, and this is on the host system. This is a 64 gig host. Um, it's got a lot of, a lot of this purple stuff on the top. This was a reboot that happened last night. I'll talk a little bit about the reboot later. And so this yellow stuff is actually un, unused RAM. Um, you might think you need to have a lot of unused RAM, but that's not necessarily the case. I mean, you pay good money for RAM, so you do want to use it. Um, you just want to make sure that you don't run out. <laughs> now, what the operating system will do when um, it's got free RAM to spare, um, this particularly the database, it's going to make use of that as cache. Um, so seeing all of this RAM being used as cache, that's not a bad thing to see. That's a good thing to see. And we can see that's been fairly healthy over a period of time. This is like over the past week. Um, so RAM, RAM seems to be quite well allocated on this machine. Uh, there's quite a lot being used. Um, and whatever's left over is being used as, as disk cache, which is a good thing. Um, we don't like to see too much swapping. And there is a bit of swap happening. This is this red stuff on the top. Something else I think we want to investigate because um, too much swapping um, is excessive use of the disk. It's generally not good for a database server. Anyway, I don't want to spend too much time on Merlin. That's usually why I start. I look at that. The other thing that's very useful to look at on Moonin is you look at your database, your Postgres, the Moonin database plugin. Ah, we should look at the disk first as well. Let's, let's just go up here and look at the disk. Um, uh, the disk, one of the things that, um, 
generally seems to determine the difference between a, a well be, well performing DHS2 system and a well performing database and one that isn't performing so well is disk latency. And so I always have a look at this disk latency here. The disk latency you can see generally is okay. This S SDB is getting a high 27 milliseconds. Um, generally these kind of figures here below 10 milliseconds or into the microseconds is more what you like to see. Um, what I can see here is generally those figures are good, except for a little bit of extra activity that seems to happen in this dev SDB. The dev SDB, as far as I recall on this system, is the swap disk. So it could be that some of this, this, these high latency figures and some of that swap memory that we're seeing um, used from the other graph is related to some issue with the swap. So again, uh, this points to something that probably should be investigated to see whether we can improve some performance. It's not good to see, see um, maximum latency figures like this. If you've got high latency, basically this is when your CPU is going to be an IO weight. Um, and you always want to see your latency figures some, somewhere less than 10 milliseconds. Um, for the main disk of SDA, that's where the database is sitting on. Latency figures are very good. You see, it's, it's never over one millisecond. So the actual access to the disk and stuff is good. There's something going on with the flopping, with the swapping that's maybe not so good we need to look into. A disk usage obviously is useful too. Keep, a, keep an eye on, and you can see here with a disk usage that we're currently using 50%. You see this little spike that happens. Um, you expect that that happens in the middle of the night when the analytics is running. I think if we look at it over the month, when we look at it over the year, um, that's a funny, we haven't been seeing this. Usually expect to see this spike happening every day. <laughs> um, we, uh, we don't need to worry about, about running out of disk space at the moment. Um, we've seen, seen a kind of growth happening here. Something happened back in October. We don't know what it is. Maybe Oswald and, and Kwame will know. But, uh, for some reason, our disk usage, we must have cleared out a lot of files all of a sudden for some reason. Don't know why that was. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, back in October, uh, a staging instance uh, came up on the same machine when we're testing uh, one of the versions before we do an upgrade. And that has since been taken up. So I'm I think that is part of it. And okay, so what, whatever happened back in October it was obviously the backup. The, okay. Yeah, the backup script to take off. Some backup that we've been stored on that day. Okay. Anyway, whatever you did back in October was a good thing because now it looks like your disk usage is quite stable. It's growing a little bit each week, but not going crazy. <laughs> um, the other thing I look at on Moonin is, is the Postgres, Postgres uh, plugin. And probably the most important graph to look at on this one is the, the connections, this one. Um, again, this is reasonably healthy. You can see, when you see 80 like this, approximately 80 connections, um, look at it for, I think there are two databases here. One is a staging one. Yeah, okay, let's look at it on here. There's the DIMS database, and then this is a staging server here. Uh, is averaging around 80 connections. What that typically means is that the disk, the, the, the pool, the database pool, and we're going to look at this in a bit, um, is probably just set as a default value. Interesting when you look at the comment in the dhs2.com file where you set the maximum connections, it says the default is 40. Uh, but I think that documentation needs to be updated because the default is actually 80, not 40. So you can see uh, what actually was the case here was that the number of database connections was set as at the default. It hadn't been, hadn't been set to anything higher. And one of the things I did last night, because um, I thought that was maybe a bit low, 
is we increased that to 200. And I'll tell you a little bit about why we did that uh, when we look at the glow route. But this generally is a useful graph to look at, um, kind of things to look out for here. Uh, you see there's a bit, of, a bit of time with some of these connections, they're waiting for lock. Um, you kind of expect that if you see too much of it, then you know you've getting into some kind of problem that connections are deadlocking or, or blocking one another. But generally this pattern seems to be fairly consistent. It's important to realize, I guess, that um, the way Moonin works, Moonin is a fairly simple tool. It just takes a sample every five minutes, right? So you're getting a kind of average picture of a snapshot of how things look every five minutes. Um, that gives you quite a lot of information, but also it means that you're not getting the kind of instantaneous information, what's happening in between those five minute intervals. Um, and I think what is happening here, even though you don't see it, is that there are spikes happening here where sometimes you actually look for quite a lot of connections in a short time. And that's simply something to do with the way the DHS2 works. I've increasingly come to understand that a lot of the API calls uh, it may be a single API call, but it can sometimes have tens or even hundreds of database queries that happen as a result of a single API call. And that can mean quite a sudden rush of database connections required, which wouldn't necessarily show on here. Anyway, we'll look at that more when we go to the, to the Glow route. Uh, the other plugins on here, okay, the Apache plugin, the Nginx plugin is kind of similar. Um, this kind of thing is they just give you a good idea of, of what your daily load is like. You know, access is per second, typically peaking at around 50. And is that more or less always useful? I find these kind of long-term graphs quite useful to understand, you know, how has the system been changing over time? Not hugely, it's got a, been a little bit busier in 2023 than it was in 2022. Um, and the load is, yeah, getting up to, this was about 70 per, 70 per second earlier this month. I guess that's probably related to, um, because this is a, a aggregate server, um, this must have been the week when most of the reporting was happening. That's when you expect to see a higher load. There's a plugin that's missing on here that hasn't been installed, which is the Tomcat plugin. Um, Oswald, we need to talk about this for me that we haven't enabled the, the Tomcat plugin on Moonin. Um, the Tomcat plugin has some quite useful information to look at as well. Uh, unfortunately, we won't be able to look at it here now because it's not plugged in. Okay, so that. That's your kind of very broad overview of what's going on. I said Moonin gives you a reasonable picture um, of whether your system is functioning healthily. And I suppose, yeah, my big advice when looking at Moonin is, you know, you have these handful of handful of charts that you know is useful um, amongst quite a lot that are less useful. Um, and it's always good to look at them if you see something strange happening, then also look at, well, what's been happening over a longer period of time? Are you seeing any kind of anything drastically changed? Um, so for example, I went back to that disk. Let's just go back to that disk. We saw this problem. We were seeing this problem with swapping on the disk. Um, so I wait, is this something new or has it been happening for forever? It looks like this is a problem with has always been there. It's not something that's recently developed. Um, something that, um, yeah, probably should have been investigated back here as to why it was happening. It doesn't seem to be causing huge problems at the moment. There's quite a lot of excess CPU capacity on here, as you can see. All right. That's Moonin. But the main thing that we really wanted to talk about was this glow route. Um, if you're looking for the source of Glowroot, this is where it comes from, glowroot.org, you can read a little bit about it. What it says is that um, having it on your system 
um, causes very, very little overhead. And our experience has been that is certainly the case. There's no great um, performance problem with putting the agent on. Um, and as we will see, it gives you lots of information. How you actually do it, well, again, if you're using the kind of automated installation tools, it'll do it itself. But I can show you here, I think. Um, let's just have a quick look. It's installed on the on the Tomcat container itself. Um, and you'll find it at the place where All your Java ops and things are set. The place where you set your Java ops with the standards Ubuntu or Debian install Tomcat is in this file, etc. Default Tomcat dot line. Um, and in here we can see that um, hmm, I haven't looked at this file before. <laughs> Uh, okay, I see it now. You've got 18 gigabytes of RAM allocated to that JVM. Seems to be about a good a good amount. We'll look at a little bit of that in a bit. Um, and this last line here, essentially all you have to do is put the low root jar file somewhere um, and then add this line to your Java ops, say my, minus Java agent. And that'll start up this glow root thing it's a has a web-based interface. It listens on port 4000. Should be able to see that. Um, here it is. There's your Tomcat running there, and this 4000. Um, you see, it's the same PID. It's running. It's the same Tomcat. Um, it's listening on a different port. That's your Glowroot profiler. Uh, It does mean that if you want to look at these glow root charts and things, you do need to enable a location on your proxy server to um, access that port. So that should be that should be opened on the firewall. Let's see here. Yeah, we're allowing proxy server to access port four thousand and port eighty eighty. Right. So that's that's simply so that we're able to look at a glow root. Okay, so let's have a look at it. Um, this is kind of the main graph or page you come to when you log into glow root. <clears throat> right, it's showing you the web transactions. Um, and you can change the time period here from the last four hours, to the last half an hour, um, back to the last 30 days. Again, like with Moonin, it's good to see how, how are we looking today compared to the way things are generally in the month. Uh, and yeah, you can see that things were a bit quiet and then they got a bit busier, then they got busier, busier still. And this week is starting to get quieter again. And I suppose this is because we've come to the end of the, the reporting period. Um, General load on here, yeah, that throughput getting up to about 3,500 per minute. It's a busy enough server. Ooh, Ghana is a big country. I think their DIM system is quite big. Um, on the left hand side, these are a list of all the all the API endpoints ordered in terms of how much load they're putting on the server. So um, one of the things we can see from here over the last 30 days is that 61% of the load is related to these analytic calls. Um, one of the things that you can conclude from that, often if you're trying to just generally improve the performance, I think there's a, there's a, a, a law to this, they call Amdahl's law, <laughs> which says, you know, if you're trying to improve performance, uh, essentially, you want to try to find the thing that's consuming most of the time. And if you make that a little bit better, 
your whole system is going to be better. If you find something that's used very rarely, a very small part of the system, but it's actually very inefficient and you improve that, then the impact on the whole system is going to be much less. So it's useful to see requests ordered like this, because if you were trying to do a general improvement on things, you would start here and say, well, this is analytics obviously is using quite a lot of, of CPU to anything we can do to improve that we should. Um, followed by this custom data set report. So the custom data set report, um, it's much less than analytics, but it would be the next target to look at. So as you can see from Global, it gives you a lot of information just looking at this front page. Um, uh, looking at it, not in terms of throughput, but in terms of its, its um, um, response time. I think this is actually the front page you would typically get. You can see that the response times are generally quite flat and quite low. And every now and again, we get quite big peaks quite big peaks happening. Um, what we'd like to do, obviously, is to re reduce those peaks, right? <laughs> and so we have less. Um, as I said, I did a little bit of tweak on here last night in the hope that we'll actually reduce a bit. Um, things aren't, haven't been as bad the last couple of days as they were the week before. Last week, obviously, was a little bit stressful. Um, we can have a quick look and what was going on last week. Um, one of the things that's a little bit interesting looking at this is that again, a lot of this time for these long running requests, they're not actually doing anything, they're waiting. Um, and then quite a lot of JDBC collection going on. Um, usually when you're seeing, you know, very slow or very slow response times, what you expect to see is that, you know, there are very heavy JDBC queries going on. Uh, but as you can see here, the contribution of those JDBC queries is not so much, right? So if there's any slowness in this system, it's not really about slow queries, right? Whatever's causing it to be occasionally a bit slow uh, is related to something else. And it seemed to me that this waiting that it's doing and this time it's taking getting connections uh, is potentially a bit of a problem. But let's go back and see what's been happening today. All right, this is, I don't know, what time is it in Ghana now? I think we're just about over the hump. Let's look at the throughput again. Yeah, we looked like we hit our peak time about an hour ago. Does that sound about right, Oswald? Or Kwame? And now we're still busy. It's kind of, it's kind of yes, over the hump. So it's about 12, 12 uh, midday in Ghana now. Okay. So it looks like things are things are slowing down a bit. You're kind of just about over the hump. I think that's fairly typical if I look at it over two days. Um, yeah, very rapid, very rapid leap of activity in the morning. Um, and then things by 12 o'clock or 12 o'clock my time, um, things start to ease off again. So the traffic pattern today is very similar to the way the traffic pattern was yesterday. Um, how has the performance been? Well, let's look at the response times today and yesterday. Uh, we had a nasty little spike yesterday around about there. Um, then another nasty little spike a little bit later on in the afternoon. Um, we haven't seen any of that yet. So that's a good thing. <laughs> we'll know a little bit better towards the end of the day how it looks. Um, if you do have... Okay, the other thing that's... If you want to get into more looking at... Okay, these are looking at the sort of general picture, if you like. Um, the other thing that's worth looking at besides just the web transactions, I'm going to come back to the web transactions in a bit, but it is to look at the JVM itself. Um, and by default, it's showing you this, this graph with the heap memory usage. And you can see this heap memory usage is kind of bouncing around around nine gigabytes 
peaking up to about 11 or 12. Um, we know this machine has got 18 gigabytes allocated to it, so this is a very healthy place to be. There's no problem really with the RAM allocation. If you do have problems with, with basically not having allocated enough RAM, then often the symptom that you see um, is actually excess CPU usage. It's kind of a little bit counterintuitive you would expect if you see too much CPU being used that you need more CPU. But often that's an indication that you're struggling with RAM. The reason for that being that when the, when the JVM starts running out of memory, it has to start getting much more active with this garbage collector. So the garbage collector becomes very busy and sometimes you find then that 90% of the CPU is just being used up by, by trying to keep reclaiming memory. Um, those kind of problems are quite easy to diagnose with flow root if you look at you look at the, the amount of, of time that garbage collector is being used. Um, these two graphs, the old generation and the young generation, um, you would see and then, well, this thing is peaking at 5.8 times per second. That's not, that's not, um, this is milliseconds. So it's being used like 5.8 milliseconds per second. That's not catastrophic at all. Right? This is just a garbage generator doing its normal business. Um, and the, the old generation garbage collector hardly being used at all. So this is a, Example of a system where there is no real issues to be concerned about the memory allocation. You might even argue perhaps it's got too much. If you needed to take that RAM and allocate it to something else, maybe give us give, maybe you could even give a little bit more to the database server, a little bit less to the Tomcat, and it would still be running all right. Um, you can look at the actual CPU usage of these graphs as well. Again, we're not going to see anything very interesting. You can see it's the green and the purple, um, are generally very low CPU usage. Um, so yeah, that, the JVM graphs, these ones, uh, generally they're very useful to look at when, when you've got problems with CPU and RAM. And this would give you an indication that you know, if the things are not properly configured. In this case, fortunately or unfortunately, depends which way we look it up, we've got no real traumatic things to look at here. Everything seems to be looking good. So let's go back to the transactions. I'm still half hoping that something bad will happen, but I'm also very happy that nothing bad has happened. <laughs> um, what I was suspecting um, is that because the, the, the connection pool hadn't been changed from its defaults, and because this is quite a busy server, I don't know, you've got like, there was about 8,000 users the last time I looked, maybe it's more, maybe it's less now, but it's quite a lot of users. We saw from the throughput that it's got, it deals with fairly heavy traffic. Um, it probably, needed to have a higher number of connections than what we were giving it with that default pool size of 80. Um, I've changed and that the fact that it's spending quite a lot of time waiting, the fact that we're seeing little bits of time where where um, it's taking a lot of time getting, getting the connection, um, that's sometimes an indication that the pool is not configured quite how it should be show you the changes we made to the pool last night. Let's first of all, just look at the diagnostic. The other thing you, it's worth looking at is the slow traces. Now, slow traces can be a bit slow to open if there's too many of them. So um, I find it sometimes it's useful. Let's look at a smaller, smaller time period. We're just looking over the last seven hours and let's look at what's been slow in the last seven hours. Um, Oh, you can see right through the night, everything was fairly quiet. There's a few things here taking quite a long time. That took five minutes. This took five minutes. This must be something related to 
analytics and so forth. What are, what are these things? Ah, does it get you into the detail of it? Um, these are some very big analytics requests. Um, I'm not sure the detail of what it's about. But clearly, it's a heavy one. It's taken five minutes to run. Um, and this one, the reason for the long time, it's actually just the query itself, right? So this thing is doing quite a heavy query. Hope that this is not a query that's going to happen too many times. Um, you can, if you suspect that something you can do to improve the query, you can look here at the actual queries itself. And you can see this is the culprit here is this one. Um, this query here. <clears throat> For some reason is slow. It looks like it's going over, going over a number of years, picking up the yearly from analytics. 2020 and 2019 and 2018. Um, if we would reason to believe this thing was causing us a problem, then um, it would be a case to go to the database, perhaps taking this query as it is and running it through explain and analyze and finding out exactly what's slow about it. And maybe seeing if there's ways it could be optimized. Um, I can't give you a diagnosis here and now, um, looking at it, I would have to, as I say, put it through the analyze and see. Again, you can make a note, Oswald, Kwame, it might be worth thinking, I don't know how often this happens, whether it's just a one-off or um, it happens, it happens at an interesting time, very early in the morning, Somebody is running this. Um, this thing here, taking a similar amount of time, or whether it could be the same query. Um, it's obviously, again, it's an analytics query. Um, somebody different. Again, it's taking quite a long time to run. Um, there's your JDBC query there. So we've got a Typical enough server, I guess, where it's got some analytics requests, which are which are very heavy. And I've got one suggestion. I made one suggestion um, last night about something to do to perhaps avoid the problem if, if it happens a lot. Um, a useful thing, if you do have a troublesome query and you want to raise it with developers, I think one of the most useful things about Glowroot is that it's a good it's a good way of communicating um if you have problems instead of you know going to go back to the developer saying no my system is very slow you can tell them very specifically i've got this query here that is very slow is there anything that you can do about it um, and glory gives you a nice way of doing that we can take one of these things here um, and say well this query is bothering me uh is very slow uh can you analyze it if you click on this thing here download the trace so basically you can download this whole view as a zip file there um and then you can send that trace file for somebody else to look at this is much better than taking us people often take screenshots right so somebody would take a screenshot of this and show it to me and say bob what's going on it's much easier if they just download the zip file and send it to me because then i can i can um, go into the query stats and things and see what's going on. Okay. Um, one of the suspicions I had, um, and I'm going to look at um, not so much that. Now, th this, is, this is a classic one here that's often very slow. Yeah, this get metadata action. Um, see, typically, this takes about five seconds. Uh, one of the reasons I pick on this one is because when you look at the when you look at the request, one of the things you note is that it's only one request, but it results in three hundred queries to the database. Um, so a lot of lot, a lot of little queries going on as a result of one request. So you can imagine if this if this comes or if two or three of these come at the same time, then suddenly 
there's going to be a lot of attempts to gain to gain database connections and to to execute them so it's not so much that particular queries are slow uh, if i look at this um, well, in fact, one query is quite slow. This select, I've seen this before, select data element being slow. That's something to kind of, to maybe look at. But the fact is also that there are many, 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 many different queries. And sometimes if you have a big flurry of queries like that, you may find that your database pool kind of instantaneously becomes a bit clogged up. And that's the reason why I made a few changes. I'm gonna show you the changes that I made on the comp file last night with Oswald. Um, and we'll just have a quick look again to see whether it's made, had much impact. And then we'll open up for questions. So, yeah, if you've got DHS, your DHS comp file is in here. Um, I'm gonna try to avoid the database password, but um, particularly as it's being recorded, otherwise we'll have to. Oh, this is good. I'm looking at the file from the bottom. One of the things that wasn't configured before was this uh, server side cache. This is something that uh, I'd strongly advise you should always enable, right? The, the server side cache. Because basically, every time you make an analytics query, um, if you cache that at the server side, then the next time somebody makes the same query, and this is often the case if you go and you open a dashboard um, and then you log out, you log back in again, you get back to the same dashboard, you're gonna be making the same query again. Um, so dashboards do cause the same queries to be executed many, many times. It's a really good idea to cache them like this. Um, that reduces the, the strain on the database a bit. Um, Oswald, I don't know, I don't have access to the front end and we were, talking last night did you find that your dashboards are loading a little bit faster this morning than yesterday yes i uh, checked it this morning and they were loading a lot more faster is it is it kind of noticeably different yeah um because it, it it should be if you enable the cache because it means that yeah. th those dashboards should be coming now without having to always go back to the database to get the data. So that's one change we made. And definitely, with this is an aggregate system. I know a lot of people are more interested in tracker performance problems, but for today we've been looking at an aggregate system. Um, this thing is can make a very big difference. As, as we saw on the GlowRoot graphs, most of traffic on the server most of this of the heavy traffic on the server is analytics related so anything we can do to improve that so the other change that i made on here just up here somewhere yeah here the pool size wasn't set right it was just commented out and you see the comment says default 40 it's actually wrong the default is actually 80. Uh, I checked that the maximum connections that's that been configured on the database is 400. So we can easily handle more than 80 connections. So we increased that to, to from 80 to 200. Um, and these two settings here, um, this is ah, something I discovered some months back. Lanzi, I think it was looking at your system in Rwanda. Yeah, yeah. That, that, uh, we saw mostly where you had an external database that um, one of the things that your, the pool does, it maintains this pool of connections. Um, and it, when it takes out a new connection, it'll test it to see whether the connection is good. Um, and the problem is when you have a request like the one I showed you there, you know, it's going to have 300 different different queries executed off it. Um, when you have a request like that, and it maybe suddenly requires a lot of connections, then the process of acquiring new connections can be quite heavy. So one of the things that you're able to do is to say, well, don't test the connection when you check it out. Right? Just check it out and try it. If it works, it works. If it doesn't, it doesn't. But when you check it back in, in other words, when you make it available for some other transaction to use it, um, test it at that point instead. 
right? So we're not putting bad connections back into the pool. So those are the three, three changes related to the database pool that we tried out from last night. And we want to have a look through the course of today. So far from this morning, everything looks okay. It's not dramatically different from yesterday, um, except it does seem that dashboards seem to be loading a little bit faster. Um, and we haven't seen any spikes yet, but it's too early to say whether we are going to or not. We need to keep an eye on this. Let's go back to yeah, get this thing out of the way. Um, I mean, we're actually over the big peak at this time. If I look at the response times over the course of the day, yeah, eight hour day. Um, everything is pretty good, right? Averaging 100, 100 milliseconds, no big spikes. Um, um, the slow traces that we're seeing. The other thing to worth looking at, in fact, is the percentiles. Percentiles just shows you 50% of the connections are down here. So 50% of the connections, I mean, they're giving you a response in 7.9 milliseconds. Um, up to 95% of connections are giving you a response time of 200 milliseconds, which is not bad. And we're having very few, I mean, we saw some example there. So there are a few quite heavy, but they're only, you know, 1%, right? In the 99th percentile, where we're seeing uh, a couple of these going up quite a bit higher. We can see how does that pattern look compared to yesterday. Uh, let's go back two days. Um, and yeah, so far it looks like we managed to maintain the flat even on those heavy ones. Um, but as you can see from here, if we were looking yesterday morning, it wasn't actually looking that different either. Be interesting to see when we look at this again in the afternoon, have we got rid of some of those? Okay, that's that's enough for me. We could we can talk about glow root and looking at different kinds of problems with it all day long, but I want to stop there um, and open up for any questions and thanks to the Ghana Health Service team, his, his Ghana in, in waiting for allowing us to use their server as an example. If anybody else wants to volunteer theirs in a subsequent week, I'm very happy to do a performance review of. So particularly if you have something which is creating particular problems, we can look at it together and not give away any data necessarily. All right, any questions? Uh, hi, hi, Bob. Uh, this is uh, Mahinder, and uh, recently uh, I have joined uh, his India. So actually, uh, uh, my question is that uh, I have set up a one server, and there is no any uh, Alexi container, uh, and uh, <clears throat> I have set up DHAS two application as the, per the document, and uh, uh, I have also set up a glow root over there as right. per the instructions but uh, uh, as this is a blank database there is no any data right now but uh, and uh, i'm not able to see any kind of like uh, uh, there is uh, api slash 37 or an analytics like that the data volumes data elements this kind of logs i i'm not able to see over there well, if you have i mean if you just set up a blank database yes. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, then, 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 yeah, you, you're, you're not going to be seeing any traffic. Okay, <laughs> okay, 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 fine. I, that's, that's why for, for this demo today, I, I had to ask permission to use, to look at the Ghana one. Because if I just set it up on my laptop or something, it, it works fine, but then there's nothing really to see. Um, so yeah, what I'd suggest, you, what you should do is put Glowroot on one of those production servers. Okay, fine, fine, thanks. Thanks. Particularly Thank if it's you. one that you that you know is having some trouble, um, then you can Thank share you. what you see. A question. A question. Yeah. Uh, well, thank you for your present presentation. And now I have two question questions. First is, uh, can we set these environments in a way that they can be centralized? Uh, what I mean, let's suppose 
environment where you have multiple ser servers and maybe the system administrator want to get all the inf information from multiple server in just one server. Yeah. See, is, this, is this possible? Second, secondly, what is your take on the difference between this and Prometheus and, and Grafana? Thank you. Hmm. Okay, two good questions. Um, first of all, um, which one will we take first? Yeah, Glowroot can be set up in a centralized way. Um, you need to look at the documentation. I think it's just show it here somewhere. But you can have a, a centralized collector for Glowroot and put it, um, have it, uh, you know, have everything. Um, centralized to a to a glow root panel it's not something i i've done often because um, first of all it only makes sense if you are managing quite a lot of systems and i know in rwanda you are now managing quite a lot um and you know it tends to be sort of particularly jvm related all of these metrics in fact are just coming off jmx on the question of prometheus and grafana what i will say is that um um they're both very good looking they're very both very good looking environments particularly um you know, grafana gives you gives you very nice looking dashboards quite a lot of configuration involved um in order to package something out of the box to give you you know good value is quite hard to do um in a general way i think if you if you're setting it up in your own environment and then you have time to tinker on it and customize it, I think it is possible to um, um, do it quite. You can get all of these same metrics, for example. In fact, all the metrics that you're getting here off Glowroot, um, they are just coming out of JMX, and you can you can query your JMX with Prometheus, but it would take you a lot of effort and a lot of work to put together uh, views like what you're getting off this one um so yeah my view of those monitoring i like them a lot um but it takes a lot of effort to configure an environment properly one of the things i know that i mean one of the reasons that we have moonin running for example is not because moonin is very beautiful i think moonin is quite horrible i think um but it's really easy to set up <laughs> and so almost for free you get lots of useful information um one of the things that i know tito has been looking at is also Zabbix. Um, I quite like Zabbix. It's much better looking than Moonin. Um, it's a little bit more configuration work required to, to get a good environment going. Prometheus, I think if you've got a very Docker-centric environment, particularly, you have everything running on Docker, then you know Prometheus works quite well in that. It doesn't require Docker, obviously, but... Um, it's, it fits into that paradigm quite well. We have some metrics exposed on DHIS2 using Prometheus. I found I had a look look at some of them a few years back. I don't think there's anything particularly there that's gonna give you more information than you're getting off this um, and also the proxy the proxy log file. So I haven't put too much effort into it yet, but I'm very happy to look at anything that people might have done in the community. If you'd set up a nice Prometheus Grafana environment. Um, the other one, which is very popular is the Elk stack. You know, the Elasticsearch and Logly and Kibana. I think that Danny and the Solid Lions people are very fond of the Elk stack. So Manza, yeah, that's it. I, 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 think they're very, I think they're very nice. They're quite hard to package in a way that that you know they're all going to come pre-configured out of the box. Thank you. Thank you. I'm just uh, trying to see who is who is on here. Um, okay, Bob. I've got a couple of queries. Uh, I was wondering if any of these uh, systems have a notification or alerts system, like uh, to send out if, if anything has been uh, recorded out of the ordinary. 
Look, sorry, yeah, just, yeah. So, sorry, who's this? Sorry, it's Damien from MSF. I, I, oh, I hi, Damien. Brussels, yeah. yeah, alerts. Alerts is a really important thing. Um, um, I don't know if I've actually not checked whether you can do alerting off Glow. Glow is more of a diagnostic tool. And a monitoring Moonin for sure. If you look at Moonin, um, you know, the Moonin that we have here, um, you see there are you can set thresholds here on all of these matrix. So you can see there's six critical. Um, something has 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 triggered something over the threshold here. I'm not sure what it was. It looks like ah, it's a disk. That's a disk usage on this thing. <laughs> Um, which is a virtual disk anyway, so it doesn't make any difference. Um, and yeah, this is the same thing. It's just this this directory is causing an alert. So Moonin, you can you can configure thresholds on all of the metrics, and the default way of configuring alerting off that would be through email. So it's a little bit little bit old fashioned. Um, that's the way I've done it in the past. Um, it would be possible, I suppose, to to send that email to a a kind of custom SMTP service gateway where you could convert them into webhooks or something else. But yeah, the standard alerting mechanism of Moonin is using is using uh, email. Alerting is a kind of general topic, and I think we need to talk some more about because you know in the past we've we've tended to advise folks to set up email alerting uh, for all kinds of things. Um, email is a little bit tricky for folks to set up. I find in terms of organising the making sure their DNS settings are correct and the DMARC settings and making sure stuff doesn't end up in spam. Um, I'm quite interested in using using things like Telegram for alerting because Telegram bots are actually quite a low barrier of entry, quite easy to set up. But it would be a matter then of linking in some of these monitoring systems to your alerting system. So yeah, my answer is I'm not sure. I think I read somewhere that you can do alerting off Glow Root. I've never done it. Um, I think you can. Um, Moonin, yeah, certainly alerting is is built into it. Um, but it's it's email alerting. Okay, no worries, Teams. But you highlight an important topic we need to talk some more about is setting up alerting systems of various sorts. Yeah, because this requires some manual looking and it's not really an auto feature that yeah. people I mean, would, would, would look at day by day anyway. Yeah, it, it, it's not adequate, certainly, if you're running a lot of systems. Yeah. I think uh, here in OCB, we have a lot of Docker Dockerized uh, servers arranged. So we have at least four, four or five environments for DHIS. So, yeah, it would be good for us as well. Yeah, well, probably, I mean, the, the, the Glow Root stuff is, as I say, it's just, it's just essentially using JMX. And there are all kinds of of agents you can use to get alerts off of of um, JMX metrics. I think even even Prometheus, for example, Prometheus will will um, gather your JMX met metrics uh, metrics, and you could configure alerting off that. Now, Glowroot is more it's more kind of a diagnostic tool, I guess, than a monitoring tool. I go to I go to Glow Root when I have problems. <laughs> I usually look at my Moonin to see whether whether my system is is um, being well behaved or not. Okay, good to know. So because you can uh, configure you, you can configure Glow Root within your your Docker container with your your Tomcat as well. Just means you probably have to make some adjustments to your Tomcat configuration. <coughs> okay, so uh, I see the time is up. Yeah.
So can I um, ask a last question? Okay. Yeah, I want to know if there is a, a best practice to set up a password on the morning monitor. Is there a what? Sorry. To set up a password on the morning monitors. Yeah, you do that. You do that through your through your proxy. Um, it's not there by default. Um, but you have you have to um, configure basic auth on the proxy. I'll I'll make a note of that after just to to, to make make sure there's some documentation on how that should be done. Um, we do have a script that does that automatically. Um, we need to maybe maybe we should integrate that into Tito's Ansible scripts so that it has a password by default. Because yeah, if you just install Moon in in the basic way, it's going to be open, which is generally not what you want. Um, I can show you how to do that. Maybe maybe next week I'll I, I'll show you the little the little configuration snippet that you need to do. Okay, uh, um, Bob, may, may I just ask one question? So yeah, yeah, who's this? Say, who's uh, this? Yeah, no, this is Gerald. Um, oh, Gerald. Yes. Um, so the question that I want to ask is like in a case where in there is a spike, and probably you are not um, because like for instance, um, um, it took me for a couple of times for me to notice that there was an error um, that somebody was actually doing a query of the whole database. Right. Um, I, I looked through the 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 cat Tomcat log, and I couldn't see. I couldn't actually see what what was going on. But then when I looked through the glow, I then found out that, that there was somebody who was doing a huge query and that query was actually um, taking the system down. So in such a situation, is there any way we can configure a notification system? Uh, let's say for instance, when, when, the, the, when the request takes a, a, a some amount of time, let's say like 10 minutes, it sends a notification that there is a query or something, or there is, a, there is something you need to look at. And I think there are a couple of systems now that are integrated with um, Telegram. Is that possible for, if, if it's not only email, but is there a possibility for us to, to integrate it with Telegram so that it just sends you a notification that something is going on with your server? I don't know if that is possible using uh, um, Glowood or Mooney. Yeah, I, mean, I think there are two two things there, General. I mean, first of all, the, the the Telegram thing. I think we we want to we want to make a more kind of generic mechanism for make it to make it easy for people to set up Telegram bots for getting all sorts of alerts related to DHS too. So yeah, that is a active area we're looking at currently, um, particularly on long running queries. Yeah, that would that would certainly be something that you could. You could get alerts off. Um, um, and then, yeah, um, I'm not sure. I mean, getting a telegram alert to say you have a long running um, web request, sometimes a little bit hard because, <laughs> you know, you know that it's run for long after it's finished. Um, you'd have to. Sometimes what's easiest to look at, in fact, not so much the web request, and usually the kind of scenario that you're talking about results in a, in a long database query. One of the useful graphs on the Postgres plugin on Moonin is the long running queries. Where are we? You can see here, um, um, You have queries here which take quite a long time. They, they kind of finish off. What I've seen in some case, and I think you would have seen it in this case here, it's like a triangle like this, a query which just keeps going and going and going and going and going. You know? uh, one of the things we could do on Moonin is put in, a, put in an alert here, right? A, a, um, a threshold. But if your query, it's good, these are not bad, they're not. Okay, so some of them are bad. They're taking like five minutes. Um, you could put in an alert that you've got queries running for more than three minutes or something. You want to make sure you don't end up with too much alerts. The important thing, I guess, in your Postgres configuration is to make sure also that you log those queries. 
so that if you get queries running with a certain amount of time that you log them. Um, but yeah, where you'd get the, the best place of getting the data from, um, if you want it, if you want it kind of live, um, you would have to query the JMX um, metrics to get it, or you could get it from PG Stats table on on Postgres. So Postgres will tell you, you know, in a live sense, which query is currently running and how long it has been running for. Or you can get it after the fact if you look in your in your proxy logs. The advantage of looking in your proxy logs, um, and again, you could have a script that does this that would send you an alert if any query has has, has run for more than five minutes, let's say, is that then you also get information about um, potentially the username, certainly the IP address, uh, and things like that. But I think the important thing in your case, Gerald, was that um, this thing had been happening and you didn't know it was happening, if I remember correctly. Um, and that was partly because you didn't have any kind of general monitoring solution there at all. Yeah, Bob, I, I, we'll, we'll continue to look um, into it and uh, and see what, what we can do. But, but, but basically, yeah, um, the glue was extremely helpful because um, we had the challenge and, and, and it seems as if somebody had a third party layer wherein the query we're coming from that third party layer onto our system and um, through the API. And so regularly on a specific period of the day, that query is being executed. And so we were struggling to find out what was the problem. And firstly, the first thing we noticed that was that the, um, the, the RAM that was allocated was not sufficient. And then secondly, we were able to identify the user and then eliminate the user. So that was that was extremely helpful from global. Yeah, you know, often this kind of detective work is is kind of multi-layered. That I mean, often in my case, I find Moonin gives me a first indication that something doesn't look right. Glowroot gives me a more detailed a detailed picture of what exactly is not right. Um, and then you look into logs from there to find out, well, if, if Glowroot is telling me that I've got this particular request is causing problems, then I need to go and look in the in the proxy log um, to find out you know, who has initiated these requests and whether they're happening regularly, uh, whether it's a machine, what the user agent is, that kind of thing. We'll spend some time maybe in a subsequent session talking about log files and how to, how to make sense out of them, how to analyze them. Okay, we are a good bit over time now. I suppose we're going to have to, we're going to have to leave it there. I can see a spike just beginning to happen in Ghana <laughs> as we talk. Yes. So th thank you, Bob. That's been um, a very informative session. So on a lighter note, also is that we are planning for the integration academies and and sub-admin administration academies in Rwanda in the next, uh, I think, two months, it's March 22nd to 20, 30th. So I've shared the links on, on chat for those who are going to be interested. We, we are we're totally interested, but, but uh, <laughs> for some of us, like, like I mentioned in the last time in the group, for some of us, it's going to be a personal. Um, it's going to be a personal. <laughs> it's going to be a personal uh, 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 improvement, uh, and 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 when you consider in the cost, that's uh, almost like five thousand dollars, right? Because based on all the expenditure that we've been um, uh, we've budgeted, um, though I'm looking for a partner who might support, but. Is it possible for us to have a discount, for instance, for those who are doing both? I don't know. If you want to do both, is it possible for us to have discount? I'm I'm just pleading for myself. I don't know. If... 
Oh, the Joe, you, you'll save on one set of flight tickets. Because you don't have to get you don't have to go to two academies. I don't I, I, I don't I, I don't know, Gerald. I, I don't do the money, unfortunately. Um, <laughs> these are the kind of questions we need to raise with with Alice. <coughs> I don't think we've talked really. Nobody's raised this before. The thing of having a discount okay. for the two. I'm not sure. I think the the the, the Hispra Wonder folk are calculating the costs based on the the conference packages. Um, so I'm not sure how much room for maneuver there'll be in that. But okay. I'm, okay. 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 If, okay. If there is a discount, I'll let you know. No. No problem. No problem. It would be interesting if it was a quasi conference, like um, in person and virtual as well, like have different price structures. Yeah. But anyway. Yeah, I think. I mean, what we might try to do, um, because we know a lot of people won't be able to get there. Um, we try to do some sessions virtually as well. Um, and I don't think there's any reason to have any cost associated with those at all. So we'll try to have some free virtual sessions. But I don't so, think we'll be able, I don't think we can do the whole thing virtually because it's, I don't know, I, you kind of lose some of the benefit of being together when you're you're also trying to manage the Zoom and everything else. Yeah, but we can talk. We can talk more about that in the in the weeks to come. All right. Thanks, Bob, for that. That was really interesting from my perspective. Okay. Thanks, guys, for 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 attending. Got any good ideas or things that you want to look at for next next week? Let us know. Um, so we, we're trying to we're trying to build out a calendar of of things to talk about over the months ahead. Um, always happy to get suggestions. I'm interested to know with what's going on with this glow root now, but I'll look at that afterwards. Okay, thanks, Tito. Thank you. Thank you very thanks. much, Bob. Bye. Thanks, Bob. Thank you all. Thank you, Bob. Thank you, Bob. Yeah, thanks, Azul. Thanks, thanks, Kwame. Bye for now. Bye. Thanks, Bob. Thanks, Bob. Oh, for...